All right, here we go. So I'm going to do a little intro um, that I am Autumn Reese, and I am interviewing David Grace this morning, and we're going to talk about um, his experiences and work at the Student Museum in Sanford um, as Master Garden, and also a docent. And then, so if you want to start with telling us where you grew up and went to school and ended up here in Florida. Okay, how I uh, wound up in Florida goes back history. I'm from Wichita, Kansas, where I was born in 1942. Went to uh, high school there, Wichita East. One of my close buddies was Bob Gates. Nice. Uh, Secretary of Defense, formerly. Went to Wichita State University, graduated, unfortunately, four years later. Uh, I didn't think I was going to make it. I say unfortunately because I graduated with a business emphasis in accounting. And I was also commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Army in 1965. So I tried to work on a master's degree and that didn't work too well. So I found myself while well, on active duty at Redstone Arsenal, Alabama, and Missile Command. So I was a missile maintenance officer for three years. And I, decided, uh, I decided to retire early for three years. Interviewed with a number of companies in uh, Firestone. Uh, some other companies in the Midwest, but then somebody offered me a job in Fort Myers, Florida. Now, my connection to Florida goes back to 1914. My dad was born here in Oklahoma, in Lake County. Uh, my grandparents, my grandmother grew up in a little town called Bloomfield, Florida, which no longer exists. It's on the south side of uh, Lake Harris, in Yalaha. My dad was born after. paper, China, so uh, things didn't work out, uh, the price of Kaelin went south, so the family had to move to central Georgia, where the Kaelin was better quality. My dad decided in about 1937 he didn't want to be a pig farmer or be in central Georgia, where it's just a mining town. He went to aviation school and was later <coughs> hired by Walter Beach, Beach Aircraft, in Wichita. So that's where my mom comes in, and uh, so my, uh, uh, that's where my life started in 1942. Now, you know, we'd always go to grandma's house mm -hmm. in central Georgia every year until I was about 17 years old. And from there, we'd always venture down to Florida. So I knew something about Florida, and I guess that's one of my decisions about going to work for United Telephone in Fort Myers. I've been here in Florida basically since 1970. I followed the purchases of uh, Florida Telephone Corporation in Ocala. So I was there in Ocala for a few years. Came here in 1978, purchase of Winter Park Telephone. And now we know United Telephone has the uh, one company is Sprint, and the other company is right now called Century Tel. So that's how I got here. It's quite the journey. <laughs> so how did you become involved with the Sanford Museum? Uh, when I retired, and I was in the regulatory with the phone company, mm -hmm. the regulation went away. The telephone company was deregulated. Uh, so in 1997, at the age of 55, they said, the regulation gone away, and so are you. So I retired, and... Uh, <clears throat> One of the things I wanted to do was be a, a gardener. Moving to Florida and being a gardener, you have to understand things don't grow like they do in Kansas. So um, I guess I wanted to be a master gardener. So I took the 14-week course, which is one day a week, basically from 9 to 3. And after that time, time, you become a master gardener. So the day that I graduated from uh, being a master gardener, I also went back to work with a, uh, as a CFO with the Florida Safety Council. So I gave that up after three years. Now what was beautiful about uh, working at the uh, Central Florida Safety Council, being a master gardener, which requires you 35 hours a year of volunteer service. Every last Saturday of the month, here at the Steve Museum, was an opportunity to volunteer in the gardens. And the gardens started here in about 1997, 98 time frame. So for a period of three years, 
I was up here once a month to get my 35 hours a year. And after that, I just kind of hung around. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the teaching gardens um, and how they're used to teach the students? <clears throat> okay, well, when I retired the second time, I was asked to come in to be a docent. And uh, I used to teach the majority of all the rooms here, but I did fall in love with Native American history. <clears throat> the individual that started the gardens was uh, Walter Pageant, who at that time owned Higgins House just up the street here. And he was also in the same class as I was in the Master Gardener organization. So uh, being here at the, uh, the student museum, I kind of fell in love with <clears throat> Native American history. And, uh, and Walt Pageant, that's how the garden started, was he had this vision of, and he used to be, a, I believe, a pioneer docent. So he wanted something out here, and immediately right outside the windows here uh, were, were the first grounds of a uh, vegetable garden or a pioneer garden, which allowed the fourth grade students to come here, dig a trench, plant their beans, cover it up, water it, into the exhibit park outside. A couple of years ago, I challenged a lady, and I didn't actually challenge, I just said to her one day, wouldn't it be nice to have a three sister garden out here? A three sister, court, a three sister garden at corn, bean, and squash. And it uh, is part of the, uh, we, we gave up painting faces, which was about a 10 minute mission there in the, in the Native American room. And what else are you going to do with 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. So I said, well, let's take them out to the gardens, because out here in the teaching gardens, we did have a three-sister garden, uh, which showed the kids, and it would be surprising that maybe some kids don't know what corn looks like other than what's on the breakfast cereal box. And of course, the three sisters are complementary to each other. They give a balanced diet for the Native Americans. If you get your carbs from the corn, you get your protein from the beans, and you get a well-balanced, nourished diet from the squash. So uh, we also have uh, out here in the coon tea plant, which became a major industry here in Florida because it was our source of uh, uh, starch. Everybody needs a little starch. Mm -hmm. And the coon tea plant wood provides uh, that starch. And it became an industry. Uh, it was an industry up until 1909, up here in the land of Florida. Company manufactured Kunti starch. So I show the kids that because the Native Americans use that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a poisonous plant. The red berries is kind of common nowadays. It's become more popular in the local landscape. Then we move on over to a beauty berry, the American beauty berry bush, uh, which this time of year has some really beautiful purple berries on the stems. Then we tell them that grandma used to make jelly from those. Uh, Native Americans can use that as, uh, some, sometimes they say there's a little color in there that they use it for body paint or of the best use to, that I know of, it's a good insect repellent. Uh, we also stop at the herb garden and then the, <clears throat> most kids do they understand what an herb might be, uh, but they've probably never seen one, like rosemary. Uh, I generally show them four different types of herbs. Rosemary, aloe, that we use for sunburn, uh, thyme, which we use for casseroles and soups, and then there's another, there's another one I throw in there that's out there in the earth garden. Now we go around and talk about the sassy grass tree. <clears throat> then lastly, I take them to the Yupon Holly. We have a weeping Yupon Holly here in our gardens, and uh, the botanical name of that is Ilias vomitia. And it didn't take too long for the kids to understand there's something about the word vomitia. Uh, the Yupon Holly was used as a ceremonial tea, a drink. Every morning the chief and the elders of the tribe or branch would partake of Yupon Holly tea, or we know today it's called a black drink. It makes you, it makes you sweat profusely. Uh, I've been told it has six or seven times more caffeine than a cup of coffee. It'll keep you awake for 48 hours, so the hunters of the tribe would drink this, uh, drink all they could get, throw up, which was good luck, 
uh, and they would go out to the hunt and they were able to be in a st uh, steer dan stand for 48 hours and uh, let up the hunt. Do you do plantings that are seasonal here? Do you change as the cycle goes around, or you just try and c continue to keep the same basic things to teach the students? Uh, we replenish like the herbs. Mm -hmm. We replenish, of course, the Three Sisters garden. Uh, we didn't have irrigation here until about 2003, which meant that uh, before that, <clears throat> in the summertime, we just cover the gardens up with plastic and go home and don't come back until September. So now we have irrigation year round. Uh, so it's all up to the climate. And uh, we've been in a mode for the last several years, probably since, uh, since 2005. And that mode is basically called maintenance. Maintain what we have because of the uh, things that we heard about. The school's going to close up, it's going to be sold, and some master gardeners even thought about coming here and digging up the plants and moving them back to the extension, which to me is called trespassing. So what's good about the gardens right now, we've maintained them, haven't done a lot of planning other than what we do here for the students, the vegetable garden, bird garden, uh, butterfly garden, we, we kind of keep them up on that. But the other plants and the other gardens, like our shade garden, the crocodile garden, our wildlife habitat is going wild, is flourishing, and we can stand back and trim and prune yeah. as necessary. Do you have to do any extra maintenance with the roses or anything like that, mm -hmm. other than regular pruning, or do you just let them be? Uh, be surprised that the roses we have here, which are uh, maintained by the Orlando area, Historical Rose Society, uh, they're the ones that set it up back in 1997. They are what we call antique roses. Have very little response to, uh, in other words, they don't get black spot, they don't get diseases. Uh, you can get an antique rose of any size, any color. We have one rose out there, probably about 15 feet in diameter, about 8 feet tall. Beautiful rose, pink rose. Uh, we have the other roses that crawl along with the ground, like a brown cover. Uh, the Rosarin that takes care of that rose garden right now is the president of that society. So he's an expert on roses. And uh, while a homeowner might not think that uh, there's a lot of care, I don't really care. I have some in my own yard. They don't get a lot of care. So they're by themselves. They are happy. But uh, as an exhibit here, uh, he comes out maybe two or three times a year. Give them, give them a good heavy feeding of fertilizer. Uh, in the fall, we try to round up at least 20 bags, I mean big bags of leaves, oak leaves, and spread them in the rose garden as well. So, is there a lot of maintenance? Not really. We just make them happy. Yeah, make them happy. Um, I saw online, I looked up um, Master Gardeners, and it, there's a newsletter called the Seminole um, County Green Thumb. It yeah. mentioned that people can stop in and ask questions of the Master Gardeners. Do you get a lot of like adults coming in to ask you questions about planting, Florida planting, anything like that, or they just come in and see the gardens? I think that they just come in on special occasions, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully with UCF here, that we get people to, when they come in the front door, we want to get them to come up the door out the back door, because that's where the gardens are. And historically, um, uh, people that have come and visited the gardens do ask questions, but uh, sometimes getting traffic to get back there to the garden has been difficult. Yeah, possibly that'll change too since they've changed the parking situation as well, since people have to see the garden right, right. before they go in. Um, how much time do you devote to the gardens now? I know you had said you were doing like one Saturday a month to get your yearly. Is that the same or are you doing more time, a little less time? Historically, we found out over the years, people get more active on the weekends, yeah. especially this time of year when there's a lot of festivals going on. And this is the best time to come out to the gardens and work. So, uh, and it's difficult to get volunteers to come here. You know, the Master Gardeners, the main membership is probably about 40 maybe 50 members, and a lot of times they take the classes, maybe for 
one or two purposes. The guys come out, maybe they run a landscaping business, they want to become a master gardener and have that in their portfolio as they sell their services. I have a lot of ladies that come out, the last class of 24 uh, attendees, 23 of them were women. And so the, the odds are in my favor because uh, today makes it a little bit warmer. I have at least three ladies here on Tuesdays. So we quit having this Saturday end of month work day. It just wasn't working out. People were not coming out. They're more active with their families. And so uh, I try to designate as each graduating class comes along. I tell them, come on out. Get interest in a project. Uh, tell me when you can come out. And uh, Tuesday's been a kind of a favorite day. Uh, try to get Thursday as maybe another day. Some people come out here on a, one, a monthly basis. The ones that uh, I associate with on Tuesdays come out on a weekly basis. We spend anywhere from uh, right now a day like a day. We can work out here for six hours and think nothing of it. When the church bells ring across the street at noon, I call it quits. Okay, so we talked a little bit earlier about um, you being a docent with the museum. Um, when did you become a docent? I was asked to come inside uh, be a docent in the year 2001 after I retired the second time. And then you said you had mentioned you, um, you had taught the Native American room. Did you teach any of the other rooms? I taught one of my favorite ones, which I can get emotional about sometimes when I taught it, is Grandma's Attic. Yeah. <clears throat> because I'm old enough to realize that when I went as a young man to Grandma's house or to a great aunt's house that lived out on a farm in Kansas, uh, you still had to go to the well to get your water. The outhouse was out in the back. Uh, we tried not to take a bath, because basically a bathtub didn't exist. So you get all those uh, things lined up and you try to tell these kids. Uh, that's how life is. In fact, in fact, the teaching Native American history and pioneer history in Grandma's Attic, which is about 100 years ago, wasn't much different. And I've talked to the other rooms as well. Yeah. Geography. Uh, it's kind of interesting when I came here. Uh, my life as a young man you know, going into an adult kind of fits. I was in accounting for 30 years. I did so because that's how you make money. Your dad says to him, make a decent salary, uh, be an accountant, be in business. That really didn't fit like a glove. Uh, my dad and I used to look for Indian artifacts mm -hmm. in central Kansas ever since I was five years old. Uh, we were members of the Rock Society, which called Jim and Merrill Society for, uh, I took payment dues about five years ago. Uh, so I've been involved in archaeology, paleontology, minerals, you name it. Uh, I fit here. Yeah. And uh, I love Native American history because I've been involved in that. We may have talked on the phone about I was a member of Indian Guides. Mm -hmm. Indian Guys or Cub Scout, which in Kansas is about Native American history, Indian lore, Eagle Scout, Order of the Arrow. So all my life, in the summertime, we used to go out to a camp, Boy Scout camp, every week because we were a special troop. And uh, we had our costumes, you might say, and we danced for the, the audience. So. Uh, Native American history has been a part of my life, even though I'm 50% German and 50% English and Scottish. Um, was the Native American room your favorite room to teach, or was Grandma's Attic your favorite room to teach? Native American is probably one of the favorite mm -hmm. rooms to teach. Uh, Grandma's Attic coming in second. Uh, classroom is third, Pioneer Room is fourth, I would say, and Geography, uh, it comes in fifth. And uh, when I started here, the coordinator, program coordinator, she was the one that taught Geography. So the other three rooms, I, I used to teach the classroom. It was okay. 
It takes a special person. We had a special person by the name of Florence. Uh, she's a little older than I am, but she knew how teachers were in 1902. And she demanded that same uh, discipline. So that's kind of cool. Pioneer, uh, since I'm not a native Floridian, I don't really understand that until I read that book, uh, Remembered Land or Land Remembered, did I really find out something about the pioneer of the Florida. So, uh, been a collector of artifacts since I was a kid. We're talking about 60 years plus. Um, I've donated artifacts, fossils to the museum, so that's where I fit. Mm -hmm. Did you have a particular, like, favorite teaching tool with the kids in any of the rooms? I know that um, for a lot of the docents, like especially with Grandma's Attic or the Native American room, they'd have one particular artifact that they really use, like to use to teach the children. Did you have anything particular like that? Well, one of the things the kids would always come and ask, the number one question, is this real? So it kind of irritated me for some time, so I said, don't ask me that question. So I'm going to tell you it's real, even though it's not. <laughs> And a lot of the materials that we had here, they're not exactly real. Of course, you don't expect things to be real that go back uh, to 1500. <clears throat> but in my collection, we used to collect a lot of artifacts out of central Georgia, which are approximately three to four or 5,000 years old. And I bring those with me. Sometimes I wear pants that have the many pockets. Mm -hmm. And I'll fill the pockets up with anything from shark teeth, uh, Brought in a couple of meteorites that I found in Texas in a parking lot. That was a gravel parking lot. They still have to be a, something I picked up and determined by the University of Kansas to be a meteorite. So I bring that in and I pass it around. Uh, sometimes I go out of bounds. Sometimes the, the uh, program director sometimes gets a, little, gets a little irritated with me. Sometimes I go out of bounds. And Maybe teach some things, touch on some things that uh, they don't want me to teach. But I bring I bring artifacts. Uh, that's one thing I like about Grandma's attic. Before UCF came, it was all cluttered. It looked like a antique store. So just about anything that I looked at or touched was a memory. So it's kind of like the same thing with Native American, even though I didn't go back to 1513. There's a lot of artifacts, pottery, uh, I brought in pottery shards with different designs, and asked the kids, well, how did this pattern get on this piece of pottery? And it was done with a paddle, it was done with pine needles. So I try to bring in the real stuff, and I use the artifacts and the things in the room uh, to get their attention. I like the wow factor. I like to challenge the kids that when they leave, that they might go to the library and just grab a bunch of Native American books and go home and read them. So I think it's the most fascinating history about how they how and it's all about survival. The hunters, the male, the American, the female, for sure. Okay, that was survival. The lady had to fix the guy's buttons. The guy had to fix his meals. I asked the kids when you go home, who do you ask me? Who do you ask in your family what's for supper? Do you ask your dad? Probably not because he's in the living room. He's being a warrior. His face is painted black on one side, blue on the other side. He's got a big bowl of popcorn. Mom, she's slaving in the kitchen fixing your dinner for you. That's the person who you go and ask. So nothing's changed over since 1500. The men are still hunters, still warriors. Mom does everything else. So what is it like teaching fourth graders? How do you keep the children focused and, and engaged in what you're telling them? Sometimes that's interesting. It depends upon the uh, school that comes, unfortunately. I generally used to have a list of, okay, let's say this school is coming this week. Okay, I'll bring some of my artifacts. Because I know in the past they I can get their attention real quick. And some of the other schools a little bit differently, so I just go down the middle of the road and, and stick with the subject matter. Mm -hmm. Because some of the kids that come here, I, I extend myself. Um, some of the other students, I can almost figure it out based on which elementary school comes. 
They're about the same as last year. So sometimes the days are difficult. We have chaperones. I don't know if I can say this on tape. We have chaperones that like to chit chat. I'm trying to present my presentation. Sometimes the teachers are down here looking at stuff we're trying to sell in the rummage sale. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting just to see as, as each group comes through. Yeah. They're all unique. They're all different. And as a volunteer, uh, sometimes you have a problem with discipline. You have to figure out how to do that. Sometimes being an old codger like I am, uh, I've gotten in trouble a couple of times in Grandma's attic. I point to the back and say, there's a blue outfit. And give them some clues. And I might say, you know, it was a Victoria's Secret original. And I say, oops, I just stepped in it. Because it is a swimsuit that goes back to 1907. Okay? So, you know, I've been called down for that. But what the heck? I'm a volunteer. <laughs> yeah, is it hard to stay um, with the kids you're really engaged in? Um, I know you said you do go off script. Is it hard to make sure you cover everything that is set out in the curriculum while also still covering the things that you think are important? I've been kind of a rebel the last few years. Uh, I guess it's because when I first came on board, who taught me how to do this? One of the program director or the secretary, the secretary was very knowledgeable because she was called upon numerous of times to do teaching. Secretary, yeah, well, I gotta go teach that close the door and uh, cause I gotta go teach Grandma's attic or be a school teacher today. They're the one that taught me what to say. Uh, and, and it continues today. I've gone through uh, three, I think, program directors, and the same wording I heard, what I learned. Specifically, it's still used today. I mean, we go outside, we meet the school bus, and we talk about Romanist revival architecture. And I've learned this since day one. You ask a student, you ask a class, I wonder where Roman architecture comes from. If a kid says, Rome, okay, he gets a pat on the head. And after 14 years, they still get a pat on the head. I mean, it's just like going around telling the story from number one to number 20. That seems to stick in the, the idea that when the student gives the correct answer, give them a pat on the ship, or you're a straight-A student today. Do you have a favorite story about um, either the gardens or you know being a docent at the student museum? Is there a favorite moment or story with a child or even just, you know, Working in an exhibit. One of my favorite stories, again, this is something uh, I don't know if it's unique to our education system. We used to have animals in uh, the Native American room. We used to have a bobcat. And uh, I would tell the story. Things are getting kind of slow. <clears throat> or, you know, this again being kind of a little bit like a rebel, I would tell the legend of how the bobcat got his. Uh, spots on his fur. So he was chasing a rabbit one day and the rabbit went into the tree trunk, a hollow tree trunk. Well, the rabbit knew he was going to get caught because here comes a bobcat. The bobcat knows he's in there and the rabbit starts negotiating. What am I going to do now? And so he says, I know you got me now, so why don't you just set this tree trunk on fire? Well, sometimes the kids ask, well, how did the bobcat set the tree trunk on fire? And I just say, well, that's for another time. You know, I've got to keep this story kind of short. So he set the tree trunk on fire. Smoke and sparks are billowing out top of the tree trunk. And uh, all of a sudden, the bobcat realizes that these sparks are landing on his fur. Well, he's got to pay more attention to these little fires that now are carrying on his fur. And he loses attention of, well, you know, what happened to the rabbit? Now that the bobcat has all these spots on his fur, the rabbit is now gone. He's gone up the trail. He has escaped. His spots come from this story about 5,000 years ago. So I think it's kind of a cool story. Yeah, I think it's so. legend. It's stories. It's, in some cases, superstition. I think that's to be not 
say a whole lot about superstition. It's like a three sister garden is, is, is grown in a circle. And that circle is because they believe that there were higher frequencies or things out there in the universe that were focused down on a circular garden. Same thing with a dunce cap. Mm -hmm. I tell, sometimes I tell the kids that you won't learn this when you go to the classroom, but the dunce, clap, the dunce cap that you will see in there was invented by Mr. Dunce in England in the 1700s. It was a, for a therapy of, of slow learners. And again, the dunce cap is in what form? The cone. So that cone focused down all this knowledge for you to absorb between your ears. And when it came to the 1800s, of course, the dunce cap became a disciplinary thing. But again, that's going back to some superstition. Mm -hmm. It's common. You find it all over the place today. You can go down to the local cafe, and underneath the counter, you've got these little books that all about fortune telling, uh, things you can do with your dog, take your dog and get his uh, emotions straightened out. Kind of cool. Kind of cool. Any other stories you'd like to share about the museum, your experiences here? Well, you know, it's, it's uh, somebody mentioned today that uh, since they did the tinting of the termites, mm -hmm. that the place smells better. And I said, you know, I kind of miss that. What it really used to smell like. So you, you can imagine when you, you walk around here, and <clears throat> a lot of times they say, if only the walls could talk. This building goes back to 1902. And sometimes we, we don't really tell the whole story <coughs> like that. What happened during the Depression years? Uh, what did the kids wear to school? I know most of the kids, or a lot of the kids, came to school barefooted. A lot of the girls wore their same, uh, their dresses looked the same. And why is that? That's because their dresses were made by feed bags. And mom sewed the, the feed bags, laid down the street, did the same thing. So the girls came to school wearing, they did the same thing. And you wonder, well, you know, it's been cool around here in Florida which to me, I thought about why did I move to Florida? If it wasn't for air conditioning, I know I wouldn't be here. So it's, it's kind of cool. We've had visitors drop by that came to school here in the 50s, and they relate to, uh, of course, no air conditioning. Uh, the railroad yard is down the street, uh, belching out the, lo the steam locomotives in the morning, belching out smoke and soot and whatever comes out of the locomotives stacks and settled all over the city here. You can imagine what kind of, and you're, and you're walking to school as a kid, you hear the school bell ring. I mean, it's so cool. Those are the kind of things, and I like this program, history, because I forgot to ask my grandmother what life was back when she was a kid. So, that's what I like about public history. It reminds us to, uh, Start asking questions mm -hmm. about how life really was. Not about dates and people and things. You know, I don't care about when Edison invented the light bulb. We have light bulbs. But it would have been nice to ask him, what was life like in Fort Myers in mm -hmm. 1900, early 1900? Don't care about your light bulb. I want to know about your life. How'd your friend Firestone get down here to Florida? I mean, I'm still trying to find out. My relatives came from Baraboo, Wisconsin, and settled in Lake County, which was, at that time was Sumter County, in about 1870. How did they get here? I have no idea. From Baraboo, Wisconsin. They came here. Why? If somebody said, you had a child with asthma? Yeah. I had a great uncle who had asthma. That's why they moved to Florida. I still don't know how they got here. Wow, thank you very much. Um, we've covered everything that I wanted to ask about the gardens and then yeah. your work about, as a docent. Um, if there's anything else, feel free. If not, I think we're all set. I think that's about it. Okay. I generally don't talk about or I generally don't talk much at all. Well, I'm glad you talked to me. Thank that's, you very much. That's why not the gardens. You know, yeah. The whole, the why lies it, just fill it in. Fill it in, yep. Yeah.